Okay, so Paul's up next. He's our head of creative at Digital 22. Paul joined us around about five years ago. He started off as a content writer. He's done everything within the business from being a strategist to a content manager and now he's a head of creative. He's seen all our successes, but most of all, he's seen all our failures, all the things we've done wrong over the years. So Paul's a real asset to the business. He's uh, opted for uh, speaking today. He's got some great content. I'm looking forward to this. So put your hands together for Paul Mortimer. hear me all right yeah is that all right um yeah so as mark said i'm from a content background so naturally i'm going to talk about content and what i've done is going to warn you now pull some data. so whilst we've had lots of big exciting deals to get stuck into uh, i want to get stuck into some data and some tactics when it comes to blogging um yeah so a bit about me from a words background um and teaching as a background before I joined Digital 22. So I used to be a writer and a teacher, uh, and then joined the marketing world as a writer. What I want to give you in this talk is some learnings, some key takeaways, and some actionable tips. But before we do that, I want to go back to when I first started at Digital 22. Something I asked, I remember asking, and something every writer we've onboarded, and probably every client when I used to work directly with clients has asked, is how long are these blogs supposed to be? Um, so one of the publications I worked at before Digital 22 was all about, so this was like six years ago, it was all about volume and it was 300 words and getting lots of keyword targeted blogs out there, churn, churn, churn. So I, naturally when I asked at Digital 22, what do we do? Um, and the answer was around 750 words. And that was, like Mark says, four or five years ago. And things have evolved over then. So I've looked back over... Uh, a few different things and a bit of data and pulled together if there is a defini definitive answer to that. But it's something clients ask as well because obviously commercially, buying so many pieces of content, time's finite, resources finite, and we can only put so many uh, pieces of content out and we need to hedge our bets to a certain extent. So what we need to put out there needs to be right. But back to when I first started at Digital 22, uh, looking back and reading between the lines, I think I, I was hired as a growth to the team. I think I was the eighth, eighth person to join. And very quickly, I found myself rewriting the Digital 22 website. And when Ricky was out meeting clients, I don't know if some clients had delayed their start or something, but Ricky was out on the road and mentioned I should do an experiment and blog every day for Digital 22. So that's what we did. And I was sat there in this in an office on my own, Andrew was out with clients and I don't know where Danielle and everybody was. But I'm there blogging every day about marketing and something I really was interested in and learning about. So that was ace. The experiment we did brought in 200% more views by blogging every day and that was four years ago. Um, the reason we did it was we'd seen studies from the likes of HubSpot and other big players who already had thousands and thousands, if not millions of views a year. But we were a a small business, like I say, eight of us in an office, a few hundred views a month. And it brought in 200% more views year on year in that month, just by blogging an extra 22 times uh, over that seven days a week for a month period. But we weren't the only ones thinking this at the time. So if you look back over the noughties and the 2010s, the growth of content marketing as a job and an industry has exploded as people realize this, and as search habits change, as we know the inbound methodology is based upon and people are searching for information, obviously marketers have then come in and swoops on that. And that's where the, the number of people producing content has really expanded over the years. And then around 2011, 2012, first type, first type of time, you start seeing people saying, we've reached peak content production. People saying, this is it, we need to find a new way. Well, we're in 2020 now, and you can still find wins with content. It's just getting harder, like we've heard a couple of times in a couple of the speakers today, from a couple of speakers. But when everybody's producing content, you end up with lots of noise. So if you're the user searching for a... You'd, you'd know not to trust salespeople, is the, is the inbound methodology. But now people don't trust marketers either, or anything from a business, because they know that if it's on a company's website or a company's blog there's marketing intent behind it. And um, 
one of the times that really hit home was when I got married a few years ago, and I was trying to get people to RSVP for their room, so they had to pay for it, and I didn't, but they uh, weren't responding with their email address to check in because they get sent a load of marketing stuff, in their words, and all they were doing was bags in the room for the wedding, and they didn't know what inbound was, they didn't know about email marketing, but the general person knew. So everybody's aware of all this noise that's out there, and there's so much noise out there that standing out is getting even harder as well. But that's frustrating for us because as a content marketer, we're then left unheard and we're putting that effort in, like I said at the beginning, whether that's as the client paying somebody to do it from an agency, or if you're an in-house marketer, you're putting that effort in and producing content that might not even get seen apart from to your email database and to your existing followers on social. So, content's hard, and how do we get Google to show our content? They dominate... Oh, there's so many different stats. 90% um, of the search market, the Google, so it's still the smartest play to get them to show our, our content. How do we get them to do it and what do they tell us? So they say a lot, but you've got to read between the lines and it all boils down to giving value. So everything they say really boils back to give the user value and give them what they're looking for. They do that and manage that in their own way in lots of in lots of secret ways, and it all leaves us trying to guess and put the dots together. Some ways they, they get the right information to their user is using 200 plus secret ranking factors. They have 10,000 people around the world who take real search queries, look what Google presents for those queries, and rates the content that Google is putting forward. Um, that comes with a massive load of guidance, which is public and can be used. So spent a lot of time getting stuck into that. I'm trying to pull out all this and put this into tips today for you. Um, just going back to my notes, it boils down to things like the purpose of the page. Does it help the user? Does it show expertise, authoritativeness, trustworthiness? The main content quality and amount of it. Uh, website content author information and website content author's reputation. Interestingly, in there, what's mentioned and there's pages on it is the main col content quality and amount. But then publicly in uh, at conferences and on an Ask Me Anything, uh, Google, uh, Gary Ilias said that length doesn't bear a factor. So we've already got a com competing thing of should we go for length and amount or should we go for giving the user what they want? And that was one of the follow-up questions in that Ask Me Anything. And he said, just give the user the right, the right amount. As well as all that, those 200 factors, the 10,000 people doing the scores, we've got machine learning in place and things like RankBrain, which with every query, of which there are billions every day, Google then learns from how we respond. So we put query X in, they present us with 10 options. If we press that one and come straight back, they know not to show that next time for that query and so on. And every query, they're learning on that. On top of that, they're then rolling out updates nine times... If anyone knows, don't spoil it for the person next year, but what do we reckon, nine times a year? Month? A day, exactly. Nine times a day on top of all the machine learning that's going on in the background. So how do we cope with that? And how do we um, get to the top of Google and bring in some viewers? So a theory emerged that longer was better. So I spent a lot of time looking at... Um, lots of industry leaders and their studies. And some have looked at millions and millions of blog posts. Some have looked at the front end of Google. Some have looked at their users' posts and various other things in between and surveys. Uh, but that's just a sample of some of the ones we've looked at. And what they arrive at is a consensus of 1,000 to 2,500 words is best. Now, if you're trying to blog two times a week, and there's one of you, and you've got a list of other things to do, 1,000 words is enough, but should you be doing 2,500? And can you do that? And where's the right place in the middle? Or if there is a right place in the middle? It takes time and effort, so we need to look into other things and see what's working. Now, the reason for this topic, in, uh, the topic of my talk here is that didn't sit right with me as helpful for a start, but also different times of the day, I don't want to read 2,500 words. No, exactly. So we went back to basics. 
and I did a survey, and it was going to be just one slide. But So if you filled in the survey that I shared on LinkedIn, thank you very much. Um, much appreciated. I've managed to get loads of data out of all the responses. Um, I was hoping for 50 responses by the time the talk came, and I thought I could just drop the slide in at the last minute. I got 125 responses in the first two days. So what I've done is turn that into a report that you can, everyone can download after as well. Um, but the experiment I mentioned back at the beginning was about a real business, a real size business with real resource, like realistic resources, trying blogging every day and seeing if it was worth it. So the reason what I've done here is asked real users, real internet users who read for work purposes in everyday jobs like we've all got. Um, we're not producing blogs for our clients on the scale of HubSpot or Medium or Moz. They, it's in our own niches. So the user base is relatable to that. And then I've also taken a look at the, all our clients' blogs that we've produced over the years and looked at the analytics from those, again, for realistic context. So those, some of those studies look at millions of blog posts, but what I'm looking at is a narrow pool of real B2B blogs to real B2B readers. So the survey first. Depth was not important to people, which is in Google's advice. It just did not register across everybody's responses as something meaningful. A trend emerged that people want short form content, which we classed as 300 words and below, before work and then longer form later in the day. Interestingly, all those other studies I mentioned talked about less than 300 words not being worth doing SEO wise. But then the survey data we got back off real people um, in a B2B setting suggested otherwise. And early before work, before office hours basically is what I'm classing as before work, uh, they wanted shorter content. Another thing was a correlation between seniority and content length. So the CEOs, the directors, the um, senior managers and so on, regional directors, things like that, all tended to favor longer length content. Uh, apprentices, trainees tended to favor shorter form content, maybe a generational thing. Some other trends emerged as well with uh, what, industries. So IT and comms preferred longer form content. So if you've got personas in those sectors, uh, it's worth putting the time into doing longer, sh fewer amounts of content. And then construction, healthcare, and engineering preferred shorter form, just like junior positions across the board did. So the first thing we did when we got all this pulled together is shared it with the strategists, um, and then we can start using this to inform persona and strategic direction. Then the other thing that the survey focused on, for those who haven't seen it, is about time of day and what you want from your content. Because what I did when I saw the 1,000 to 2,500 words guidance was think, I don't always want to read something even in that bracket. So I'm an early riser, 5 o'clock in the morning, I want loads of words and I want to get stuck into something. But it needs to be easy to read because I'm still tired, it's still 5 in the morning. After tea, when the little one's in bed, we've got something on telly that I'm only half interested in. I'm in more awake mode at that time and I can absorb something more complex, but I don't have the time to sit and read 5,000 words, so it needs to be actionable and short. And I mapped out this full day of how I consume content differently. So for example, in the middle of the day, before a meeting starts, I might just need some quick takeaways, some tips and some actions. And I thought, I can't be the only one thinking that. What people were asking, when I uh, what people were saying, sorry, when I asked them when I surveyed, um, before and after work are the most popular times, I presume as you commute on the way to work or b before you um, get stuck into your to-do list and you're opening emails and consuming content then, so we can pick up some stuff for email timing. And then preference for reading things builds throughout the day as you can see on the graph. So what I asked was when, list all the times you like to read content and it was building peaking at 5 to 9 p.m. after office hours when you're at home. So we can not be afraid of uh, reaching people in the home setting, in a domestic setting, even in a B2B purpose. Uh, something that's come up today and something we've been talking about at Digital 22 is about person-to-person -person marketing and not only having to be constrained by office hours and then the data backed it up. Because so the questions were about B2B. So the next phase of this research was looking at our own blog analysis and seeing if that tallied with what people were saying. So what I did was pull out from all the thousands of blogs that we've done over the years, 
the top 20% performing blogs and then isolated those. And the top 20 in terms of most viewed and most CTA clicks. Um, so how we work at Digital 22 is the blog, the content team that they produce are producing a blog for the in line with the marketing strategy to get some of these details to align with email marketing. We're responsible for the bit in between, which is if they come and read the blog, we want them to click the CTA. So that's what deemed as successful blogs. The average length of most viewed is just over a thousand words, and so is the most clicked. So a thousand words is a bit of the sweet spot. Now there's a bit of context around where that number came from, um, which is, like I said, four or five years ago, we were doing 750 words per blog. And then when we saw that trend of it getting competi uh, more competitive as everybody targeted each keyword, and also at the same time as Google forcing us away from being able to write a blog for that keyword, one slightly similar, one slightly similar, and having three different blogs and three opportunities to bring in 30 viewers a time, and we have to talk about topics. We moved away two to three years ago from 750 words as a guide length and started doing the right length that feels right for the topic. <clears throat> so really historical data, they're going to be under 1,000 words, but there's enough there from the two or three years we've been doing more than 1,000 words to make it viable. But what still comes out is 1,000 words as being the sweet spot. And then 80% of those top, top performing blogs are under 1,000 words. So more often than not, shorter is up at the top of the charts with the odd outlier, which is even longer than the 2,500 that is the general consensus for blog length. So views, 1,010 words. Most clicked, 1,001 words. But there's a big but. Twice as many of the top 20% blogs are under 1,000 words than over 3,000. And then two-thirds of the top performing blogs, the top 20% overall, are under 1,000 words as well. So longer isn't always equating to better. And the best of the best, the top, top ones, are even longer than the standard industry advice. So shorter and even longer. So the 1,000, 2,500 words that was being suggested around the internet kind of falls in between. Where that looks in graph form is we've got a big sweet spot of these are the top 20% performing blogs, and around 1,000 words tends to be it, with the odd outlier, which is 3,500 words, 3,000 3, words, 3,500 words, but it's not always uh, worth the investment. So we've done other blogs that length, and they haven't risen to the top, and that's a lot of hours gone into those blogs. So it books against the trend. So then the next step is we need to look a little bit deeper than word length, as common sense would suggest anyway. So those top performing blogs we've took a uh, deeper look into from a creative point of view, from a semantics, from grammar, whatever, uh, however you want to call it, from a content point of view. So looking a little bit deeper, we'd isolated the top performing blogs and could spot some trends there as well. And these are where the tips and takeaways come in. So there's nothing too groundbreaking again. If you think back what to Google's saying and give value, that's the type of thing we're seeing here when we promise knowledge. Every blog in that list of top 20%, 20 percent performing blogs all the titles promise knowledge within it um, on a side note the interesting one was 80 percent of those titles contain numbered lists now the reason i say that's interesting as a side note is google is actively not wanting to promote clickbait and even lists is sort of hinted at as being a negative but when you look at the data of what's actually bringing in the views and the clicks on the ctas lists are very much popular with our uh, clients, users, the readers. Then we get into more specific SEO tactics. Um, things like numbered lists inside the post, bullets, anchor lists, good use of imagery, clever use of H2s, good white space, short paragraphs. Making it readable on mobile um, will take care of a lot of SEO factors within it. And things like an anchor list, so you might have three chapters in the blog post or three sections listing them at the top and having a hyperlink to that section. Little touches like that was prominent in all of these most popular blogs. The average paragraph length is three to four paragraphs, and it was just noticeable, it was consistent. And if you've done any, like, SEO 101, how to blog, well, these, are, these is nothing too groundbreaking. Um, it's just about doing them all, I think. 
And then the biggest takeaway really was 90% of those posts had a super relevant CTA. And what I mean by that is words in the title and topic of the title of the blog post was also the topic of the CTA. So if your download that you're trying to entice people's details out of them with is to do with X, if the blog post is to do with X, there was a 90% 90% of those blog posts that were performing well had that connection. And going back to Google's uh, advice to their 10,000 quality raters and what they say publicly, um, they only want to show content from trusted authors and people who produce content to help the user rather than just to get views or what you can boil down their uh, advice to. And if we're doing all those things, promising knowledge, using numbered lists, a highly relevant CTA, we're actually doing that for the user. So, what that boils down to in tactics is these five key takeaways. When I mentioned not wanting to always read two and a half thousand words every time of the day and every time I read something on the internet, everybody else thinks that way as well. If people want a short post, give it to them, and if they want a long post, give it to them. Instead of thinking how we used to be able to of, we've got 20 keywords all on a similar topic and we can do 20 blogs about it, it's more about finding that topic that's interesting and finding as many different routes into the topic for that person's context at the time. If people want the answer quickly, give it to them. One of our, I think it is our most viewed blog, is how much does PPC cost or how much does AdWords cost? And that's not, we're an inbound or a HubSpot agency. We're not a PPC agency. But if you're just trying to find out how much does AdWords cost in the UK, the answer is in the first sentence. And if you just want an average, I think, I can't remember what it is, but £1.10 to £1.20 as an average in the UK, it's there in the first sentence. If you want to find out how to use it in inbound, if you want to find out how to use it in your own um, B2B setting, if you want to find out X, Y, or Z in more depth, all that guidance is then there in the post. But if you just need that nugget of an answer, which is in the rich snippet, it's there in the first sentence. But we're not bothered about giving that answer away because that person who wants that information isn't right for us. When they're ready for the deeper read, it's there ready and waiting. And that's what point number three relates to. If you can give deeper insights in the form of another blog post or a download, then don't worry about trying to hit a thousand words for that blog post. Give them a 200, 300 word announcement and tell them you've got the depth waiting, ready for when they need it. Organize all that on the front end for the front, front end experience of having clear headings and structure and easy to navigate to find that more in-depth content. And then in all those aspects, put the user's query and context first. So if we'd written 3,000 words before telling people that the average cost for PPC is 1.10, 1.20, whatever it is, nobody would have ever clicked on that blog and Google would have realized that blog was useless for that short, quick snap. It never would have ranked in the first place. Challenge for all of you guys then is to take that knowledge, take those five tips, think of a way of making it more impactful you. I've tried to put the challenge to check the CTAs on your top 20% performing blogs. Is it as super relevant as it can be? If not, change it. And if you don't have something to readily put in place, you've got your next content idea. Because the data show 90% of those blogs that are bringing in the views and the clicks to the CTA had a really closely linked download piece behind the CTA. So if you've already got some posts with traffic and you don't have the download that that person is interested in, they're going and getting it elsewhere. So if you can offer it them on that post with views, they're more likely to convert into a lead. And secondly, check the context of your uh, blog posts. Do the ones that have gained some views over time, they might have dropped off recently and they're probably the ones to look at. If they've had views over time and aren't performing, check that the context matches. Is the search query probably hinting at that they need a quick answer, they want a quick I or two, they want, or do they want an in-depth deep dive? And then reevaluate what that content is and make it match the user's context. And if you do only one thing content-wise out of this, there's two different things. There's, there's 
you could change your CTA and plan your next content piece, or if you've already got it, you can do a bit of a content audit. And thank you, and any questions about content? Thank you, Bob. Thank you.